tripling e bits on it. And it's done 170 miles, 1,000 miles, and it's still going strong. Following that one is a 35th anniversary Range Rover. This was produced in 2005 to mark the 35th anniversary of Range Rover, and there was only 35 of these ever made. Uh, this one is number 14, and it's in anniversary claret, which is a, a unique colour to this model, and it was the most expensive Range Rover ever produced. When it was new in 2005, it was £85,000, which was a... It, they didn't sell very fast. Following that one is the 40th anniversary Range Rover. There were 700 of these worldwide in Barolo Black, and they came in either the 5-litre supercharged petrol or the 4.4 TDV8 diesel, and this is the diesel one. And uh, they either had the jet and ivory leather or jet and pimento. Now, pimento is a strange bright red colour. So this is the nice ivory version. Following that one, we have a 2011 grey, which is almost the last of the third generation Range Rovers. Um, this one is a 4.4 TDV8. And this has got the upgraded dashboard. They don't have dials. They have what was called thin film technology, so everything is backlit with back projection, so there's no dials on it, which is very odd to look at. And the very clever telly screen in the front, where the passenger can see the telly or the DVD, and the driver can only see the sat-nav. Now, the last vehicle round, the white one, is the fourth generation Range Rover, the L405. And this particular one is a 2015 Vogue SE, top of the range, 3-litre diesel. So, as you can see, we, uh, we've covered the whole gamut from first all the way up to last, without things like the Sport and the Velar and the Evoque, which, ah, we don't need them. We like the full-fat Range Rovers. It looks like we're waiting for the Land Rovers to come in, so I shall now hand back to the proper expert. Right. Thanks very much, Helen. That's given us a good insight into the, uh, the Range Rover range. Now we start with the Land Rover. Sorry. Are we going round this way, are we? Right, OK, fine. Right. Land Rover is the first one with a hard top, and this is the Series 3. And behind there, we've got a Series 1. Now, this back to the original thing. And this is what they originally built for as farmers' cars. And interesting, he's got the Brockhouse trailer on there, and you'll see the churns in there as well. And behind uh, Graham, he's got his son Tim, keeping an eye on Dad, yeah. And Tim's got a, a very nice Land Rover. They ignore the number, it's actually been in this area from new, but under a different number, it's original number. And here is a Q registration uh, Range Rover. This is typical of the sort of Range Rovers that... Uh, get pushed into service and uh, imported back into this country and produces a somewhat different. Keep going. And behind there we've got the uh, Land Rover Lightweight and on there he's got the chalk number and that way is where you chalked on there what the weight of the Land Rover was if you were loading it onto an aircraft so you knew that you weren't overloading the aircraft. Now a bit of a pause there. And we'll see what's coming in next. There's a couple of dingoes, there's a dingo standing there, I don't know where he's coming in. I can see a bit of movement. Anything could happen. Think about this, you never quite know, oh, here we are, come to the dingo. Now, the interesting thing of the dingo, the chap at the top of the observer, he sees what he's doing, but the driver is down in the small hatch, and he's actually attempting to steer. But it's a most peculiar steering wheel that's got on there. And behind there is the, that was the Austin Chubb. This was the, uh, designed by the committee, cost a fortune, and they found that a Land Rover could do about 90% that a chap could do, and about a third the price. Um, 
great thing about the Champ was it had a reverse gearbox, so it could go backwards as fast as forward. I knew it for reconnaissance, that was the theory. But how do you ever control it in reverse, I don't know. Austin, uh, with a multi-fuel engine now, running rather fine. Think about a multi-fuel engine, if you haven't got any diesel, rather than uh, stopping, they could uh, put a jet fuel in to keep going. This, of course, is a great thing with Army. If you haven't got any fuel, you're totally stuck. And this, of course, is why it's such a, an incentive to, to bomb uh, fuel depots, for example, to starve them for fuel. Bedford CA van now, and this is an odd one. It's got the characteristic... Actually, you haven't got the bumper yet. Most of these things, they've got a rattling front bumper. You can always recognise. This is the short wheelbase van with the sliding door, but if you don't ratchet them out in the, old, them in the open position, they're fatal when you're doing a hand signal. Another of David Elwood's restorations, this is the Bedford, but with the diesel engine, and uh, travelling in stuff, and again, he would have got that door in the open position. That's interesting, you get two short wheelbase Land Rovers, two short wheelbase uh, Bedfords. Now, this is an interesting thing, the Ford pickup truck, and uh, this is in, where is it, South Africa, was it originally? New Zealand, oh right, yeah. Rather well, uh, a proper youth then, so it's, it's been working hard. Coming in now, we've got the uh, Scammel. This is a six-wheeled machine. Only the back two axles are driven, but even so, it can get almost anywhere. And they tremendously articulated the back axle. Got the diesel. Plenty of power there. Not speed, but uh, he got there in the end. I'd love to see one of those things actually up on a block, because you can drive over a, a foot or more block, and it's still got both traction to both wheels. And of course, you can also put tracks on there as well for extra grip. Certainly on the way Morris now, this was a, a light, uh, light Morris lorry. In fact, I mean, with a ton, I think, in the army. The they, always, they always rate them low. And this, of course, is the International. Remember I mentioned earlier on the International Tractor Factory produced lorries as well. This is actually rather fine. And the hitch on the back is, uh, is put a British hitch on there to give it more weight. Our engine now, this is the uh, Shrewsbury one, and they've got some of the uh, rather interesting crew at the back as part of it. Coming in here is the Tower uh, Hill Transport. This is the AEC Mammoth Major. And for many years, these were the, the heavy lorries on the road. Built by AEC. They weren't fast, but they got there. Associated Equipment Company, of course, they were basically bus builders, but they built lorries as well. And very good lorries they were too. Coming in now, we've got the uh, Red Wing, Carmichael Red Wing. This is actually a normal control Land Rover, and they converted it by uh, Carmichael to a forward control. And uh, interesting Coventry Climax pump on the back. That, a lot of those were used during the war originally. There is the carrier, an unusual mate for a fire engine. Based on Wallingford Fire Station. Of course, small, small fire station, so they put a small appliance in there. Nonetheless, she did well for many years with the Marshall Fire Brigade. Warminster Combined Division. They built both uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, they've got a full complement there. Now, this is one of the more interesting vehicles. This is a Shell Burton Drury. Now, normally SD you associate with uh, dust carts and the like. But this is actually a power appliance, so you can see the massive hitch on the back, the uh, legs are held it steady. There was a turntable escape on there originally. Coming in now, Amy Louise. This is uh, February's... Uh, they were a tipper for many years, this particular thing. And then they converted it to a breakdown. And uh, 
and then another owner converted it to a platform vehicle for usefulness and now this present owner has put the platform on the back as well for transporting equipment. Rather interesting is Chevrolet Picker, rather fine, not a vehicle you normally see in other service in this country, turbo. This is uh, size matters as a fair description. So this is a hillbilly deluxe, that's a bad description of them. But uh, the American uh, pickup was, of course, much bigger than the uh, British pickup. That was probably about a five ton hauler. That's a remarkably small commercials coming in. Ah, oh, here we go, here's a few more. They're just catching up with it. We're getting even faster than they cope. This is the Atkinson coming in. This has actually got an interesting engine because uh, it's got the Gardner 240. There weren't many of those. Those are the eight of the Gardner engines. They weren't uh, made in big numbers. And that's why the extension cab on there, the sleeper cab, is rather useful because it covers the rear two cylinders of the engine as well. This would have been uh, Pulling an articulated lorry, heavy weight too. And again, that's the Atkinson version. This is the ERF version of the same sort of vehicle. And this has got the, uh, I think the Cummins diesel in there. And he's got the dirt molded cab on there. Might even be a gardener, we'll find out about that afterwards. Double drive uh, axle. But interesting, he's got super singles all round. So that was uh, a rather. Uh, fine thing because the super single took the same weight as twin wheels but you only had the single wheel so they were a bit lighter so you could save a bit of paint of uh, mass on the towing unit and that in turn meant you could carry a little bit more of that weight of the load and still remain legal. Now I don't know whether any of the others are coming in or not there's, there's plenty of interesting vehicles there but uh, you know, it's just a matter of whether they can be persuaded into the arena or not.